as per the available epigraphic evidences, we are able to date back the Ram temple and the Ram worship to 12th century CE, for sure. Tamil inscriptions and the Tamil literatures offer brilliant proof and they actually push uh, the date of uh, Rama worship as well as the Ayodhya Ram Mandir by a couple of centuries, both on epigraphic grounds as well as on literary grounds. And uh, for various reasons, these Tamil references were not uh, represented before the Honorable Court uh, for many reasons. Uh, and that is exactly what we want to uncover. We want to learn uh, what new insights are available from the Tamil sources. And that forms the crux of today's topic. Namaste, everyone. Welcome to this uh, talk on Rama temples and the cult of Ayodhya, specifically from references uh, in Tamil. My name is uh, Gokul Seshadri, and it is such a pleasure talking to all of you today. And it is certainly a blessing of uh, Lord Sri Ram that we are discussing this topic on this uh, auspicious period when we are all anticipating the Pran Pradishta of uh, um, Bhavya Ram Mandir at Ayodhya. So let's uh, get into the presentation. A brief introduction about myself. I am actually a software professional working in the US. Um, and uh, I have been a, a student of uh, Bharatiya history for the last uh, 20, 21 years. Um, so out of my interest uh, in history, I did uh, MA and MPhil. And uh, again, by the grace of uh, God Rama, I got uh, an opportunity to research the narrative Ramayana sculptures. Uh, um, and uh, that, that uh, became my PhD topic. And, I, and after completing PhD, I got even more engrossed into this uh, subject. So I pursued my research further. And uh, just last week, uh, my uh, research uh, has been published as a book. It's titled Ayodhi Permal, and uh, currently it's available in Tamil. Hopefully, uh, an English edition should be available very soon. You can learn more about my research and also download some of my papers uh, in the website academia.edu. And uh, the talk um, we are going to uh, discuss uh, the talk I'm going to present today actually forms a chapter from this uh, book. So it's uh, fresh from the bookshelves. So um, looking forward um, um, to this talk. All right. Why should we discuss uh, about the uh, Rama temples and why uh, specifically Tamil Nadu and uh, what does it have, it has, uh, what does it have to do with the uh, broader context of uh, Ramkatha traditions and Rama worship? So, as you all know, during the Ram Janmabhumi uh, court case, uh, the very historicity of Rama worship uh, became uh, a big contention. So, one side of historians started arguing that oh, Rama worship is a uh, uh, a rather recent phenomenon, so it cannot be dated back to uh, earlier times, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So there is this, uh, this, this question was uh, very heavily discussed. I don't want to get into the details, but uh, suffice to say that the historicity uh, and, the, uh, and when it actually started, when Rama uh, came to be worshipped as a god, uh, became, a, became a discussion point. The second discussion point, as you all know, was about the antiquity of the temple itself. Whether there was a temple, and if so, what was the nature of the temple, and so on and so forth. Many of you would have followed the discussions. And um, from a court case perspective, the, the main issue was whether the temple existed before 15th century. That was, that was the key point um, where uh, uh, arguments were uh, were placed on either side. And one of the most decisive uh, references, historic records, came in the form of uh, an inscription, a very long inscription that was uh, recovered 
within the uh, the Babri Masjid premises. And uh, today it's called the Vishnu Hari inscription. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it it it's uh, it's from a period uh, roughly attributed to mid of uh, 12th century CE. So the Vishnu Hari inscription gave a definitive proof that the Ayodhya Ram Mandir, the original Ayodhya Ram Mandir actually stood uh, or was constructed uh, around 12th century, mid 12th century. And there were further ar archaeological excavations that were undertaken by ASI and that pushed the, the date of an earlier Mandir, right? It showed that there was a an absidal temple. It's called Gaja Brishta Vimana in in uh, in the Tamil parlance. It's a it's an uh, uh, it's not a circular. It's an absidal temple, and that temple actually dates back to 10th century CE. So <clears throat> the inscription says uh, the temple was constructed uh, in 12th, but uh, ASI found an earlier uh, remnants of an earlier temple uh, in uh, uh, which belongs to 10th century, and it's very common. The, the core or the nucleus uh, structure is maintained and uh, further additions uh, will be done without disturbing the core nucleus. Uh, that's how uh, 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 temples were expanded as, as it be, they became more popular and so on. So what you see on, on, on this side uh, is the pranala uh, and, uh, the, and, and the inscription um, that, was, uh, that was discovered. We, will, we are going to see more about this inscription in later slides. So, as per the available epigraphic evidences, we are able to date back the Ram temple and the Ram worship to 12th century CE, for sure. And, and the temple itself uh, dates back to around 10th century CE. And this raises uh, quite a bit of interesting uh, questions. You are talking about nearly a millennia. Uh, because uh, Valmiki Ramayana uh, dates back to a few centuries before Common Era, and then we are here talking about 10th century. So, th so roughly for a millennia, what happened to Ram uh, Mandir and Ram worship? Was there any temple at Ayodhya? Was Ram ever worshipped as a god before 10th century and so on and so forth, right? And this is, this is exactly where the, the Tamil inscriptions and the Tamil literatures offer brilliant proof and they actually push uh, the date of uh, Rama worship as well as the Ayodhya Ram Mandir by a couple of centuries, both on epigraphic grounds as well as on literary grounds. And uh, for various reasons, these Tamil references were not uh, represented before the Honorable Court uh, for many reasons. Uh, and that is exactly what we want to uncover. We want to learn uh, what new insights are available from the Tamil sources and that forms the crux of today's topic. And you can obviously see how relevant and how important it is, not only for the Ayodhya Ram Mandir, but on, on the broader Bharatiya uh, cultural traditions and context. So if we step back from the topic of Rama temples and take a broader view, what we see is the Ramkatha traditions, right? This is a, a much broader term. And uh, I am using the term Ramkatha instead of Ramayana because uh, Ramayana refers to the a particular literary version of Maharshi Valmiki. Whereas Ramkatha is a, is a more generic storyline that was adopted all over India through many different art forms, as you can see here. In fact, some of the earliest uh, uh, performers called bards, um, in, in Indic tradition, they are called sutas and makadas, and in Tamil tradition, they were called panars. And probably they were actually um, rendering Ramkada among other tales. So they will perform these stories in front of uh, common people uh, with music, sometimes with dances and so on. And we see this tradition continuing to exist. And this goes back to a uh, couple of centuries before uh, uh, Maharshi Valmiki. And many scholars believe that Valmiki actually drew uh, some of the nucleus uh, of the story from these oral traditions. And there is also the ritualistic Akhyana tradition 
wherein uh, Brahmin priests were uh, performing these long narratives or, or akhyanas um, in, in yajnas. Uh, for example, there is a reference in Satapata Brahmana that uh, talks about this. And very interestingly, the story of Ram also occurs in, uh, in Mahabharata, uh, Krishna Dvaipa in Abhyasa's uh, Bharata. And the story of Ram, the section that narrates the story of Ram is called uh, Ramo Pakyana or Rama Upa Akhyana, which pretty much points to this uh, Akhyana tradition. So, um, so you can see that the oral traditions were powerful and these were being recognized by some of the uh, earlier authors of literature. And then there is a very strong uh, literary tradition, which uh, we all are aware. We have the Buddhist traditions in the form of Jataka tales. We have uh, Valmiki's Ramayana, which became uh, uh, a more definitive version of the story. And it became very popular uh, in the in the earlier centuries of, uh, of common era. And then we have the Jaina traditions, uh, Bhaumacharyam of Himalasuri, and then we have Kalidasa, Srahomsa. We have a series of literatures. Uh, and then uh, Kambar's Ramavataram is a, is a monumental epic in Tamil. And it's considered the, the pinnacle of uh, Tamil literature. And that happens to be a, a Ramkada uh, version, which is very interesting. And then we have epigraphic evidences starting from second century onwards. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, inscriptions uh, influenced by the slokas of Valmiki Ramayana. We have uh, comparisons between kings and the and the valor of Rama. And we have uh, we have an uh, interesting evidence from uh, uh, the Nerur uh, copper plates of uh, King Mangalesa which talks about uh, his ancestor, his father, Pulikesi, learning uh, Itihas, uh, which means uh, learning of Itihas uh, became an important uh, criteria for kings to do the uh, Nidhi Paripalana or, or rendering of justice and, and so on. And uh, lastly, we have uh, sculptures and narratives um, which start occurring uh, in more regular intervals from 4th century until 6th century uh, uh, in many Gupta temples such as uh, Bedgon, um, uh, Apsad, and we have we have several instances. We have even a, a temple in Bangladesh which has uh, Ramkada panels. So, but we are interested more in, uh, in the Rama temples today. But this picture actually tells you that uh, there was a slow progression and transmission of Ramkada traditions and the Ram Bhakti development. So the Rama temple should be seen as a net result of this, this Ram Bhakti cult and the, and the um, vision of Ram as a, as a Dharmic uh, personality and so on. And we have the, uh, uh, here is a very interesting photograph which shows uh, the famous uh, Ramkada panels from the Diyogar uh, uh, Dasavatara temple. And today uh, you don't see these panels here. Uh, some of them, in fact, this particular panel, which shows uh, uh, Surpanaka's uh, mutilation, um, this has been removed to the National Museum and so on. So you don't see this structure today. Many of these panels have been moved to other museums um, for safety. All right, so let's now focus in on the Rama temples and the evidence of Rama temples, Rama cult, uh, Rama worship, and so on and so forth. And you will see this uh, this timeline graph uh, or timeline graphic appearing, uh, which will help you to understand uh, uh, what kind of time period we are talking about. So for here, we are going to talk about something in 5th century and later on around the 12th century. So the earliest epigraphic evidence to the worship of Rama or some kind of divinity being attached to Rama comes from um, uh, 5th century. It's from a Gupta queen uh, uh, who happens to be the daughter of the most famous Gupta emperor. Gupta emperor. And uh, Prabhavati Gupta was the daughter of, uh, of this king. 
and she married uh, into the wakadaka family and they had a, a very strong uh, royal matrimonial nexus and uh, there are uh, two copper plates issued by this queen one is called the puna copper plates and the other is the riddhapur copper plates and there is a there is a very interesting reference in both copper plates in one of them she says um ramagiri swaminaha padamola so both of them are uh, grants to uh, you know vaishnavite uh, uh, saints and so on and in uh, here she says um, the grant is being issued from the padamula of uh, of this ramagiri swami she doesn't say or identify who this ramagiri swami is and in the other copper plate she says bhagavat padamula naivedya so she is actually offering this grant as a naivedya to this uh, this pada uh, located in ramagiri and in ne neither of these copper plates definitively identify uh, the nature of this uh, this god right but we do know it's a vaishnavite god so probably she is talking about a lord vishnu and so on uh, but um, shri uh, vivi mirasi vasudev vishnu mirasi um, one of the grand epigraphists of uh, archaeological survey of india um, he actually identified uh, where this ramagiri is located and not only that he was able even able to identify the nature of this uh, this uh, this temple or sanctuary or whatever right based on a very interesting evidence from kalidasa's megaduta so what mirashi did was he read the passages of megaduta and he was able to uh, correlate the path of that mega right or the clouds and he was able to locate this ramgiri hill mentioned in megaduta that's where the the yaksha is uh, uh, standing and he is actually uh, sending the duta to his uh, his lover and he identified ramagiri as the ramtek hill okay and not only that so once he he was able to pinpoint this the megaduta reference actually says um there there were there were uh, there was ragupati pata in this hill so now the epigraphic evidence from queen prabhavati grupta became much clearer so now we are talking not just a vishnu pada but we are talking about the rama padas and this hill is traditionally associated with uh, with the ramkada it's believed that uh, uh, rama sita and lakshmana cross this mountain on their way to uh, panchavadi and so on so um a researcher by name hans t becker he did a lot of analysis on several inscriptions that are available today in this hill um, and there is a rama temple available today but unfortunately we don't have the the path as we are unable to uh, identify uh, exactly this uh, this rama padas or the ragupati padas as kalidasa puts it in the hill today we do have a rama temple but that belongs to slightly later period so bakar actually uh, found uh, provides us with this image of how the original uh, ramagiri swami uh, sanctuary was uh, probably um, uh, built so it's a small enclosure around this padas that you can see so this is the earliest evidence wherein you see ramapada uh, being hailed and uh, and uh, the queen is actually providing this grant as a naivedya so there is lot of respect interestingly um prabhavati gupta's son um actually wrote a uh a literature uh, it i think it's the very first prakrit literature on ramkada and it's called setu bandha his name is uh, pravarasena too so the the family is uh, the royal family the vakataka gupta family is exhibiting a lot of uh, adoration for rama in 5th century so obviously that is that is all from 5th century and you can see that this is not really a temple proper 
wherein you have the image of Rama and then there are, there are there is worship uh, and, uh, and daily rituals going on. This is more like a, a footprints of Rama in the hill and the queen is actually uh, referring to those footprints and, uh, and giving donations and so on. Maybe there was some worship happening there as well. We don't know much. So that is that. Uh, and that is from 5th century. And then we have a, for many, many centuries, six centuries, we have absolutely no epigraphic re reference of Rama temples or Rama worship. Nothing of that sort. There is a very big gap. And then the next uh, series of references begin to appear from the 12th century. I was talking about the, the Ayodhya Vishnuhari inscription, which is mid 12th century. And also there are uh, two very interesting uh, inscriptions, both from the Kalachuris. The Kalachuri royal family, they had uh, like two branches. Uh, one was called the Kalachuris of Ratnapura. And uh, there is an inscription of a king called Prithivideva II, who says uh, that he has actually built uh, a temple for Rama. Uh, today it exists uh, in a place called Rajim and the temple is called Rajivalochan temple. The temple still exists today. And some of you might uh, recognize this name because Rajivalochana is, uh, is a name given to Rama uh, which uh, literally means lotus eye. Uh, so that inscription dates uh, to uh, you know 1145 CE roughly the mid of around the same period as the as the vishnu hari inscription and the second reference to a rama temple comes from the second kalachuri's family which is the kalachuri's of chedi or tripuri and here uh, the the inscription is called reva stone inscription and it's uh, it was issued by a general of king vijay simhadeva this general's name is Malay Simha. And during the course of this grant, he casually says that he, he built a temple of Rama. So this inscription itself doesn't talk about uh, building of any Rama temple, but it casually refers to Malay Simha as the builder of a Rama temple. So it's actually providing some credit, religious merit to this general. And uh, in the passing, it says that uh, uh, this general built a temple of Rama. So, so we see uh, multiple references emerging from North India about uh, building temples for Rama, kings uh, uh, investing themselves in building many temples. And the, and the Vishnu Hari temple uh, uh, inscription talks about a, a lofty temple at Ayodhya. So it was not a small temple. And in fact, uh, many of the pillars that were recovered. If I remember around uh, 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 six, uh, uh, 17 rows and six pillars each and so on. So it's, it was a very big temple. So now the, the big question that we need to answer is what happened between 5th and, uh, and 12th century, right? Uh, we, are, we are talking about uh, a gap of nearly six centuries in the first millennia. And uh, really, how old is uh, Rama worship in Bharat, right? And why we don't see evidences and so on and so forth, right? That's the that's the uh, the backdrop in which we want to approach the Tamil inscriptions. So remember remember this gap. So now we enter uh, Tamil Nadu and the Tamil references, and they and they very beautifully fill this this broad gap of six centuries. Starting from 6th century until 9th, we have a lot of literary evidences proving the divinity of Rama and his identification as an avatar of Vishnu. And then from uh, roughly uh, 9th century onwards, all the way till 13th century, we have 21 temples of Rama all located uh, in the in the Tamil region, ancient Tamil region. It's not exactly today's Tamil Nadu uh, proper. Uh, it was slightly broader. It, enclosed, uh, uh, it uh, uh, included uh, today's uh, Kerala and portions of uh, Andhra and so on. And, and as you will see, 
um, these were independent temples of Rama. So we have rock solid reference emerging from the Tamil sources uh, about uh, the Rama worship, Rama cult, uh, divinity of Rama and Rama worship and so on. So how did this all happen, right? Uh, no development uh, in, in any society happened suddenly. Uh, there should have been a, a, a gradual transmission and spread of uh, Rama cult. And, the, and it, uh, as far as uh, ancient uh, Tamil region is concerned, it starts all the way from Sangam ages and it continues. There are several references. But the, the Ram Bhakti cult starts uh, roughly from 6th century onwards. There were uh, uh, Vaishnavite Alvars, 12 in number, and there were Saivite Nayanmars who, uh, who propagated the devotional cult across uh, ancient Tam Tamil Nadu. And uh, we have, uh, we have uh, several hymns, uh, 4,000 in number, roughly, that's an approximate number, it's slightly less than 4,000, uh, compiled into what is uh, today known as Nalaira Divya Prabandham, or, or 4,000 verses. Um, Nalaira literally means 4,000. And uh, I did uh, quite a bit of research on all the references uh, about, around about Rama and Ayodhya in this, uh, in this literature. In this literature. And uh, it, was, it was quite astonishing that I was able to locate nearly 200 references uh, from various alvars. And these are spread over, uh, you know, three to four centuries. So it's a pretty broad timeline. And not only alvars, even the Saivite Nayanmars sing in praise of Rama. And they, they actually recognize Ravana repeatedly as one of the greatest uh, Shiva Bhaktas. So there is a lot of adoration to not just Rama, but also Ravana from the Saivite perspective. So this period saw the propagation of Ram Bhakti across the region. And this was probably the primary reason why we see Rama temples emerging starting from the end of 9th century. So the, the ground was prepared by the Arvars and Nayanmars. And uh, the, the kings that came, um, it reached a mature uh, stage towards the end of 9th century. Remember, uh, one of the most famous Alvars, who also happens to be a king of Kerala, uh, Sri Kulasegara Perumal, he is well known for uh, his uh, adoration and Ram Bhakti. And uh, he actually uh, rendered the earliest uh, entire Ramkada literature in Tamil, um, it's called Tillai uh, Tirichitra Koda Padigam, Pasurangar, sorry. So he, he uh, narrates the entire story of Rama in front of uh, uh, Rama. So that's very interesting. And so coming to the Rama temple inscriptions, um, overall, I was able to locate uh, 36 inscriptions in total, which is quite significant. Uh, compared to just the four inscriptions we saw earlier until like 12th, uh, end of uh, 12th century, right? We are now talking about 36 inscriptions, many of which date back to 10th and 11th and 12th centuries. So this is not one or two, and these inscriptions, you will see, they are spread all over the region. This is not uh, focused on uh, one particular tiny locality or something. This was pretty broad and wide and so on. And these 36 inscriptions talk about 21 temples, independent temples of Rama, located all over ancient Tamil region. And these were built by Pandya and Chola kings. Most of these temples were built by Chola kings because uh, Cholas were... Um, at the peak of their uh, their power in, in this period, starting from 10th century onwards, uh, the Cholas uh, overran Pandyas, uh, Cheras, and so on. So they were uh, in the peak of their royal power. So obviously, many of these temples were, uh, were built by Chola kings. And uh, we can almost uh, certainly say that uh, 
uh, the credit for spearheading uh, Rama cult and Ram Bhakti can be given to some of these Chola kings. There is a very interesting connection uh, between my research and uh, one specific Chola king uh, called uh, Sri Parantaka Chola I. Um, when I started my research in narrative uh, Ramkada narrative sculptures, um, I actually researched four of his temples. And slowly I understood that this emperor who, uh, uh, who belonged to the earlier part of uh, uh, 10th century, he was deeply interested in, uh, in promoting Ramkada. He was a great Ram Bhakt. And this is something not uh, widely known. And he, he did many interesting things, some of which we will see today. Uh, one of which uh, is uh, propagation of Ramkada through um, Ra uh, Rama temples, as well as uh, narrative uh, Ramayana sculptures in several Saibai temples. And that was, that was my PhD research. So um, in terms of overall features, we don't see this many inscriptions about Rama temples coming in, uh, coming in such an early period, especially in the first millennia, anywhere else in India. So that's, uh, that's quite a significant phenomenon. And we will see, we will get into some of the details. All of these were independent temples of Rama. Um, they had uh, elaborate rituals. Uh, it was functioning like a, like a temple proper with all the rituals, uh, festivals. We come across uh, festival information. And, and so on. So uh, these were proper Vaishnavite temples. Um, and Rama was almost regarded as a Vaishnavite god. Unfortunately, many of these temples are not in existence today. Um, we only have the inscriptions talking about those temples, but many of them have perished over time. We do have a few surviving, but many of these temples uh, are not available. So we are not able to understand um, the structures and so on. And one of the most uh, fascinating aspects that comes out of these, uh, these inscriptions and these Rama temples is, uh, is that uh, they seem to have some connection to Ayodhya, the Ayodhya Ram temple. And not only that, they also provide, one of these inscriptions actually provides a specific reference to the Hanuman worship, the inclusion of Hanuman within the Ram Parivar. And uh, this is the earliest uh, epigraphic reference to Hanuman worship in the whole of India. So obviously you can see how important this topic is from the, from the overall uh, Bharatiya uh, cultural context. So let's, let's go a little deeper and see where they were located and so on. So I took... Um, this map from, uh, from Creative Commons Wikipedia, and uh, I try to identify uh, the ancient uh, uh, political divisions within uh, the Tamil region. So you have the northern part of uh, uh, ancient Tamilagam or Tamil region. Uh, it was known as Thundai Mandalam. Uh, it's a, it's a, in present day, you can map it to uh, the areas around Chennai and Kanchipuram and so on, Chengalpat and so on. So that that is Tondai Mandalam. And this used to be the seat of power for the Pallava emperors. And then you have the Kaveri Delta region, uh, present day Tanjavur, uh, Nagapatnam and all these regions. Uh, in olden days, it was known as Chora Mandalam or the region of Choras. All right. So you have Tondai Mandalam in the north, the Chora Mandalam in the middle, and then you have the Pandi Mandalam, Madurai, all the way until Kanyakumari, roughly that area that was known as Pandi Mandalam. So these were mostly political divisions and the, and the rivers served as uh, natural boundaries. And there were always, you know, um, skimmerishes and sometimes invasions and so on. And then there was uh, a Chera Mandalam. Uh, present day Kerala roughly, uh, which was annexed uh, into the Ch 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 into the Chola territory uh, during the period where uh, we are talking about. So, uh, with that in mind, let's look at the uh, distribution of these uh, inscriptions. Right, we are talking about thirty-six. 
And a staggering uh, 26 inscriptions come from the this Tondai Mandalam region, which is very significant. Uh, this was one of the uh, new findings reported in my research. 72% very significant. And this indirectly means that the Rama cult and the Rama worship that we are talking about probably dates back to even earlier periods. Why? Because Tondai Mandalam was more powerful during the Pallava times rather than the Chola times. And many of these inscriptions are not talking about constructing a new temple. They are talking about donations to existing temples. So the, the question of when these temples were uh, originally consecrated is, is something that we can we can discuss. And so the, the focus on Tondai Mandalam uh, provides us some clues that at least some of these temples uh, came into existence even during Pallava times. So which means we have to date back uh, uh, this even further. But let's uh, limit ourselves to uh, definitive uh, uh, epigraphic references. And we'll start uh, uh, from 9th century onwards. All right. Uh, this uh, popularity of uh, Rama cult uh, in the Tondai Mandalam area also raises another big question about, uh, about this poet, Kambar, and, uh, and his uh, nativity. Traditionally, many scholars have said that uh, he actually belonged to uh, the Chola country and so on. But interestingly, his patron is actually from the Tondai Mandalam region, which raises a lot of questions, right? Why should a Chola country poet go all the way to Tondai Mandalam and, uh, and seek patronage from a patron there? And he's a very small patron. He's not like a king or something. So uh, I have raised a lot of questions in my book about the nativity of Kambar. Probably he actually belonged to Tondai Mandalam region, wherein he was already receiving uh, the nucleus of Ram Bhakti since, uh, since his early times. Uh, because uh, uh, rendering such a monumental epic, uh, which has stood the test of time and which is hailed as the pinnacle of Tamil literature, uh, is, is not something that can happen unless the society in which he grew supported such a cult and tradition. So I have uh, provided a hypothesis that Kambar probably belonged to the Tondai Mandalam region and so on, but we won't into a lot of details on that today. We are focusing on, on the Rama temples. So looking further, in terms the, of the nature of these settlements uh, from these 21 locations, we see that many of them were Chaturvedi Mangalams or Brahminical settlements in which all communities thrived, but they were uh, they were called Chaturvedi Mangalams uh, because the it, it was probably donated to a group of Brahmins uh, and so on, right? Um, we, we, have, we have nine of them, so which clearly sh shows that the Rama cult and Ram Bhakti was, was thriving uh, in, the, in the Chaturvedi Mangalams. And we also have a few Urs and other types of settlements. And uh, within those nine Chaturvedi Mangalams and the Urs, there is another interesting phenomenon that emerges which is this the contribution of this emperor uh, about whom I mentioned a little earlier. Uh, here is a, a solid evidence to his uh, Ram Bhakti and, and the adoration for Rama. Some of these Chaturvedi Mangalams are called Mathurantaga Chaturvedi Mangalam. In fact, one of the Rama temples that we are going to um, speak about today is called Mathurandagam even today. And there is a famous temple of Rama that exists uh, here and that dates back to uh, the period we are talking about, 10th century. And this title Mathurandaga was very specifically uh, adopted by Parantaka. Uh, after he conquered, after he vanquished Madurai and the Pandyas, he, uh, he bore this title and he created uh, these uh, settlements called Mathurandaka Chaturvedi Mangalams and even Mathurandaka Nallu and he established Rama temples in those settlements. So in some ways 
he attributed his Mathura victory to Rama. And why is the, where is the connection? Because while he was fighting against the Pandyas, the Sri Lankan army was coming in support of Pandyas. Uh, Sri Lankan's uh, uh, Sinhalese armies were traditionally allies of uh, the Pandya emperors because you see the close proximity between Lanka and, uh, and the Pandi Mandalam. So they were traditional allies. So when uh, Parantaka was fighting Pandyas, the Sri Lankan army came in support of uh, Pandyas and he had to fight both armies and he vanquished them. And uh, not just that, but there are many other reasons for this emperor's adoration, but this is probably one of the reasons for his uh, association and, uh, and Ram Bhakti. So I have ju just given a high level view of uh, all the localities from which uh, these uh, inscriptions are coming. Um, very soon I will publish a research paper in which you will get uh, all the 36 uh, inscriptions I am talking about and so on. These are just the temples and the number of inscriptions that are available from each of these localities. And those that are highlighted in yellow are, uh, are very special inscriptions. For example, uh, the, the, temp the, the temple at Vijaya Narayanam, which is uh, very near uh, present-day Thirunelveli, this supplies the earliest epigraphic record of a Rama temple in the whole of India. It's the earliest epigraphic record. All right. And uh, this dates back to roughly... Uh, towards the last quarter of uh, 9th century, around 882 or something. And then we have other inscriptions. Um, I have highlighted this Mathurandagam inscription. This is where we get the earliest evidence of the Ayodhya cult. We'll, we'll see about this later. This is very fascinating. And this is the temple I was talking about. Fortunately, this uh, temple has survived till date. Um, and you can see, even though it's not called Mathurandaka Chaturvedi Mangalam, it still retains a, a flavor of that old name in, in its in its present uh, 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 in present day. Uh, it's called Mathurandaka. And uh, and there are several inscriptions coming. This Pullalur inscription is also very special because it talks about uh, exposition of uh, Ramkada in temples. Um, Ram, uh, Ramayana and Bharata, uh, there is a lady who is providing donation and so on. And the, the Thirumalpur inscription um, is, uh, I would say, fascinating because this is the uh, record that talks about Hanuman worship, is the earliest available epigraphic reference to the worship of Hanuman in the whole of India. And this is interesting from another perspective because you see several temples of Rama had already come into existence. But we see that Hanuman being included in the Ram Parivar around this time. So there are epigraphic evidences to show that only Ram, Lakshman and Sita were originally worshipped during the earlier part of 10th century. And, uh, and the Tirumalpur inscription uh, talks about the inclusion of uh, Hanuman. In fact, uh, in my book, uh, which I showed you earlier, Ayodhi Parmal, I have argued that uh, the Chola emperors and the Chola Shilpins or the sculptors were the earliest to conceive the, the whole Ram Parivar grouping in India. We have several Gupta temples and, and Chalukya temples uh, uh, showing um, various scenes from uh, Ramayana, but you don't see the present-day Ram Parivar that's worshipped in temples. In fact, the earliest evidence, sculptural evidence, to this Ram Parivar or Ram Parivar grouping comes from this period, 10th century, and this comes from Chola era. Uh, in my book, I, I have actually given the earliest stone sculpture depicting a Ram Parivar from a Rajaraja temple and so on. So it's very interesting. Unfortunately, we are focused on the on the Rama temple, so I couldn't go too deep into that topic. And then uh, we have a, a whole series of inscriptions after uh, uh, 10th century, the 11th, 12th, uh, and 13th centuries. Uh, for example, the Vada Madura inscription 
uh, talks about a festival. I will I will highlight this a little later. Uh, a festival of Rama. In fact, the festival of uh, Sita's marriage to Rama. Uh, and it's uh, quite fa fascinating to note that um, even today, uh, in several temples of Tamil Nadu, we celebrate Sita Kalyanam or Sita's marriage. Uh, this is held as a religious festival even today. So it's a it's a thriving tradition tradition uh, which goes back to you know 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. Um, and another uh, temple that I highlight is, is the is the Sama Vedeshwara Temple at Tirumangalam. Uh, this was one of uh, my research temples, and this is the only temple among these 21 which contains a uh, sculptural uh, Ramkada, uh, narrative Ramkada sculptures. And this is a Shiva temple with, uh, with those sculptures, and there is a, an inscription reference to a Rama temple. So as you can see, uh, these evidences are extremely rich, and they provide a, a wealth of information. So going further, into, into what these inscriptions say about, uh, about the, the nature of worship and, and things like that, we find that out of 21, 16 are Vaishnavite temples. The, the, uh, the temples that are supplying information about these Rama temples happen to be Vaishnavite temples. Uh, and, uh, and remember, most of these Rama temples haven't survived today, but the temples who are providing or who, which are talking about this, uh, these Rama temples also happen to be Vaishnavite shrines, which shows the close connectivity between uh, Ram temples and the Vaishnavite temples in the same locality. And uh, this connection comes because of the Rama's uh, very strong association and identity as an avatar of Vishnu from, uh, from the Nalairam verses that I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, there is another aspect uh, which is uh, very peculiar, uh, which is the Saivite association of, uh, of Rama. Uh, and this starts uh, all the way from Chalukyan temples, wherein you see narrative Ramkada being displayed in Saivite temples. And, and it's a topic uh, of its own. And uh, going through the, uh, the nature of these donations and the purposes, we see several of them. Um, uh, several of them are land donations and uh, and gold coin donations uh, to provide for a perpetual lamp. Uh, this is uh, this is very common. This is called a Nanda Velak. And uh, we see Archana Boga. We see land grants being made for Archana Boga. This is very important because uh, in order to uh, do Archanas and and other rituals. Uh, you need proper canons and proper procedures. So by this time, the Rama worship and, and the cult and the rituals, they seem to have, this seems to have been standardized during that period. That's what it means. And you also see some provisions being made for uh, Sri Bali service. And uh, again, uh, this is very common in many inscriptions. Um, we find the provisions talking about providing uh, meals uh, called Thiru Abudu. And uh, there is one record that talks about uh, singing Thirupadiyam hymns. So um, provision was made uh, for, uh, for people, uh, they were called Pidaras in, in ancient Tamaragam. Uh, uh, the people who were singing these Bhakti hymns in Tamil, they were called Pidaras. And uh, provision was made to sing uh, uh, the Pasurams of Alvars in front of uh, Lord Rama, and uh, and uh, and they were given some uh, some land donations for that and so on. And we also have uh, uh, donations uh, called Tiruchennadai and Tiruvidayattam. And Tiruvidayattam is uh, uh, refers to land grants made to Vaishnava temples. And once again, we see this uh, this land grant being made to Rama temple, and called as Tiruvidayattam, which means. The distinction between Rama and uh, Lord Vishnu becomes uh, uh, very blurry. Uh, both uh, both are hailed, uh, you know, uh, uh, as one and the same. And we have literary evidences uh, also that speak about that. So, 
enough to say that they were fully functional vaishnavite shrines they were they were going through the the, the kala pujas you know uh, uh, six kala pujas and so on and so forth and the canonical practices for worshiping worshiping rama have been established by this time and all these are not possible uh, without a, a larger bharatiya train so here there is an hypothesis probably this was a phenomenon um, that was happening even outside uh, ancient tamil nadu this cannot be all these things cannot be just happening in one slice of uh, bharat and uh, every ever every other region uh, being totally silent i don't think that can be the case that has never been the case in bharat so there were temples uh, and there were there was uh, this uh, this worship and things like that going on in other places as well but unfortunately we don't have epigraphic references to those and uh, in some occasions we we come across donations made for expounding uh, ramayana and bharata specifically from a place called pullalu this is once again a, a community established by parantaka and uh, and a brahmin lady donates uh, for this purpose these were called vriddhis uh, they were called bharata vritti uh, specifically for expounding bharata but it also included ramayana and so on and uh, i mentioned about uh, a land grant uh, made for sita's marriage with rama and it's quite uh, fascinating to see that the society is actually donating shri dana uh, gifts to sita uh, as though she, she is their daughter and we come across these kind of references only for uh, uh, uma bhattaragi or the goddess uh, goddess uma or devi uh, consort of shiva and we see this kind of recognition being um, bestowed on on sita which shows the connection of uh, of people with uh, with not just rama but also the entire uh, ram parivar and the ram katha and this record is from vadamadurai it's a it's a rajendra chola inscription if i remember correct and uh, we now come to the uh, the most interesting and the most fascinating part of these uh, inscriptions Uh, and in order to understand the connection between these uh, temples located in tamil nadu and the ayodhya we need to uh, know what is called uh, uh, the tirtha kshetra concept in ancient bharat holy places or holy towns were called as tirtha that's why you have this uh, term called tirth yatra which means uh, people visiting uh, holy sites and so on um and the and the temple proper or the temple locations were called kshetras uh very interestingly in today's kerala the proper temples are called as kshetras even today so which is uh, which is very interesting so we have the holy uh, towns called tirtha and we have the temple locations or the temples called kshetra all right and uh, in in almost 90 95% of the cases when you read a tamil inscription uh, of a land grant or something to temples you always come across this uh, this uh, tirtha kshetra and the name of the god the context is very clear and very detailed so i have given an example here um in this case a donation is uh, made to uh, a temple at kumbagonam and this is how the the inscription calls this that this donation is being made to god mahadeva of keel kottam at tirukudandai so tirukudandai in this case is the tirtha the keel kottam is the kshetra and the mahadeva is the name of the temple so we have tirtha kshetra and the god is sometimes called murti so the tirtha kshetra murti concept is very important i'll tell you in a second why i am emphasizing this because the out of uh, 36 inscriptions that we are talking about almost nine of them were uh, were named as tiruvayodhi or shri ayodhya the tiru literally means 
uh, Shri. So none of these inscriptions are referring to Ayodhya simply as Ayodhya. They are always referring with great respect and they are calling it as Thiru Ayodhya. And uh, one is very curious. You don't come across this phenomenon anywhere else in, uh, in um, Tamil inscriptions except for the temples of uh, Krishna and Rama. Wherein, instead of uh, referring to the locality in which the actual Rama temple was located, the temple is actually named after Ayodhya. And as you all know, Ayodhya, uh, the Ayodhya proper is actually a Tirtha. It's, a, it's one of the holiest uh, places, one of the seven sacred cities and so on. So that Tirtha, the name of that Tirtha is being adopted as a name of a Kshetra or a temple. So you see a temple being named Thiru Ayodhya. And we, this is not one or two, this is happening in almost nine inscriptions, nine temples, which is phenomenal. So obviously we are talking, not talking about one isolated incident, we are talking about a cult. We are talking about a pattern and so on. So why, why did the ancients do this? Uh, there should have been a, a, a very valid reason because in almost all other thousands of inscriptions, you don't come across this phenomenon. So why... Why these temples were named after Ayodhya? In fact, <clears throat> there, is a, there is an inscription which is outside my research boundary. It's a later Pandya inscription and it gives you a clue of, of why this was done. Uh, that inscription uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, from a locality, it's called Kirchival and there is a Venkatachalabadi shrine there and the inscription there calls that Rama temple ten Thiru Ayodhi or Satan Ayodhya. So this very clearly shows that the ancient Tamil kings and Tamil donors, uh, whosoever built those temples, they were actually trying to represent the whole of Ayodhya in the form of a temple, which is, which is phenomenal. So which means unless these people knew about Ayodhya and knew Ayodhya, about the Ayodhya Ram temple, they wouldn't do this. I will give you an example, right? Um, let's say I am in in uh, in uh, Delhi, right? I'm uh, let's say I'm living in New Delhi, and I am constructing a, a, a Balaji Mandir, I am, and I am calling it Tirupati Balaji Mandir, right? My locality is Delhi, but I am calling this Mandir as Tirupati Balaji Mandir, and people would question me if there was there was no town called Tirupati, right? And there is no Balaji Mandir in Tirupati. People would question me, hey, why are you naming it after Tirupati? Probably it should be named after uh, whichever, it should be called Delhi Balaji Mandir, right? So unless there is a, a, a more, more famous temple in Tirupati, and I am actually trying to represent that for the sake of devotees who could not go all the way to Tirupati because it's located uh, you know, far and away. That is what has happened here. Me there were there was a population there was a cult in the ancient tamil nadu around 10th century which was deeply involved with ram bhakti which knew about the existence of not just ayodhya as a town but also the ayodhya mandir so much so they actually named these temples as thiru ayodhya now this raises big question on the dating of the original Ram Mandir itself. All right. Not only, not only the temple is being named as Thiru Ayodhi, Rama, the name of Rama is also called Thiru Ayodhi Perumal or the Lord of Ayodhya, which is fascinating. Another very interesting aspect is out of these 36 inscriptions, not a single inscription calls Rama as Rama because the royals were never called by their proper name. They were all, always called by a, a, a respectable surname and so on. And that's what happens here. These uh, inscriptions call Rama as Thiru Ayodhi Pirmal, Thiru Ayodhi Alvar, Raghava Pirmal with, with great respect and adoration. And Thiru Ayodhi Chakravarti, the king of uh, Thiru Ayodhi. You should remember in, in the Hindu tradition, 
the the god who is enshrined in a temple is a living breathing entity so ancient tamils never saw rama as a, as a historic personality or something they actually saw him uh, enshrined in the temple at ayodhya and there is a, a reference from namalva singh which says ayodhya varum he calls rama as someone who is currently presently living in ayodhya which clearly shows that the tamil people were looking at looking up to ayodhya temple and the ayodhya ram mandir with great adoration and respect and they believed that the the, the rama as a, as a thriving deity thriving entity now you can ask me what if this uh, they, they are just calling it tiru ayodhya uh, and so on what is the proof that this specifically points to ayodhya ram mandir right that's a question you tell me in ayodhya after considering all excavations and uh, and all in, uh, epigraphic references that are available can you point to any other rama temple besides the one that stood at ram janmabhoomi so there is absolutely no doubt we are all talking about just one mandir and that is the uh, the ram janmabhoomi mandir all right so what does this all mean right in the end it seems the ayodhya ram temple as it is in uniting today it has always been the uniting force for millennia at least from 9th century onwards which is which is which is spell bounding epigraphic references very clearly demonstrate uh, this cult of ayodhya rama um, and the whole rama ka rama phenomenon between 9th and 13th centuries so the a closer examination also uh, revealed that uh, the, there were religious practices around rama worship and so on and there should be a very close connection between these uh, uh, tamil nadu rama temples and the ram temple at ayodhya and i suspect this cannot be an isolated phenomenon that happened just in tamil nadu it there should have existed other temples and probably they were following a pattern we don't know that yet because we don't have any other reference coming from any other region and um, current archaeological excavations by, by, about by asi it dates back the uh, the ram Jan, uh, original ram temple at uh, that stood at ayodhya to 10th century and there is a pranala and other things that were recovered but considering the fact that temples in the name of ayodhya were established during the beginning of 10th century it raises a lot of questions right it cannot be that the ram mandir is constructed in 10th century and suddenly you know the next day the the tamil emperors start picking up those those thread no it takes several centuries for this phenomenon to slowly travel so in all likelihood there was a a brick temple or something that existed even earlier than uh, than 9th century in ayodhya so all these references are actually pushing the date of ayodhya ram mandir even further in fact there is a reference from uh, uh, nalayiram from uh, periyalwar which very specifically talks about the holy vaishnavite shrines of north india and it actually lists ayodhya why is that significant because periyalwar belongs to 8th century so from 9th century now the literature is actually pushing back one century further so it goes further and further so the original ram mandir we don't know its shape shape and form we, we see an absidal temple and so on but the references from tamil nadu are actually pushing back the the ram mandir and the cult by several centuries and that is uh, very significant um, from the overall bharatiya context and the and the uh, ram cult and ram tradition and ram worship context and and we all know that no other temple of uh, uh, ram is being spoken about so um, once again on this uh, auspicious occasion uh, i thank all of you for watching this um, you see how we have always been connected uh, the entire bharat was always connected and always uh, uh, always uh, you know singing in praise of rama this uh, this uh, ram bhakti and ram devotion is in everyone's uh, mind and heart and uh, and the tamil references remember tamil nadu is located deep down the peninsula 
So whatever you see, whatever you observe there is a reflection of what is happening all through uh, ancient Bharat. So I thank uh, Sarayu Trust and Sangam Talks for this great opportunity. Jai Shri Ram.